So now we're going to begin Roman numeral two, the Madison administration. This is the second lecture in our period that goes from 1800 to 1848. James Madison has been something that we, somebody that we've met before. He is the father of the Constitution. He was Thomas Jefferson's Secretary of State, and now we see him as president in his own, in his own right. Now, James Madison, when he takes office, he's going to inherit some problems from the outgoing Thomas Jefferson. They're both Virginians. They're both Democratic Republicans. They both have said that they believe in a weak central government and strict construction, power to the people, pro-farmer. But the problem he's going to inherit from Thomas Jefferson is, one, the economy is still bad because of uh, Jefferson's embargo and, non and then Non-Intercourse Act. Um, and two, he still has to try to figure out how to avoid war uh, with what's going on in Europe. He doesn't want the United States to get pulled into this war. So in order to do that, what he does is he gets rid of the Non-Intercourse Act and he signs into law Macon's Bill Number 2. Macon's Bill Number 2 is trying to do two things at the same time. One, it's trying to increase trade so America's economy improves with Europe. And it's also, again, still trying to avoid war um, with Europe. It, and in the past, we've talked about how trading with Europe is going to cause us to get into that conflict. And so what he does is he says, look, the Non-Intercourse Act from Jefferson said that we are not going to trade with England or France. So he says, well, we're going to trade with one of them. We have to. There are two biggest trading partners. And so he says we will trade with either England or France, whichever one comes out and says that they are going to respect our rights as a neutral, independent nation. And Napoleon is the first one to jump at this chance. Napoleon needs American food for his armies. And he says, America, I respect you. We will uh, respect your rights as an independent nation. And so according to Macon's Bill Number 2, now the United States will trade with France and only France. We will not trade with England because France came out first and said that they are going to respect our rights. Now this is a mistake because now the United States says economically, entered the war in Europe. Not politically, not with our military, but we are only trading with one side. We're trading with France, and because of Macon's Bill Number 2, we are not trading with England. Of course, it's going to make England very mad at us, and they're going to increase their harassment of our ships and our sailors on the Atlantic Ocean to try to get us to stop what we're doing. In the West, England is going to encourage Native Americans in the Ohio River Valley to rise up against American settlers as well in the hopes that they can put pressure on the United States to stop, trade, to stop trading with France. Now, the Native Americans in the Ohio River Valley are all too open to this message of fighting the United States settlers. We have this Native American here. We see his name is Tecumseh. He and his brother, the Prophet, they go around to all of these different Native American tribes in the Ohio River Valley, and they convince them to put aside their tribal differences and join together in a pan-Indian alliance um, to reject white culture and unite together to try to stop white Americans from settling into their area. They figure we can only do this if we're together. Now, the only way they're going to be able to actually fight these colonists or these Americans from coming over is if they get supplied in weapons and gunpowder. And the English are still in possession of those forts on U.S. soil, and the English will provide the Native Americans with the gunpowder, the shot, and the muskets they need to fight American citizens. This is very, very, let's go back just a second. If we're going to do a synthesis, this is very similar to Pontiac's Rebellion in 18, 1763. We see in both instances, Native Americans are creating a pan-Indian alliance in the Ohio River Valley to try to stop American settlement into their region. So the United States figures that they, well, Madison has to do something about this. And so he sends General William Henry Harrison out west to deal with Tecumseh. He is supposed to stop and crush this pan-Indian alliance to make it safe for white Americans to move west. So General Harrison, he discovers Tecumseh's Indian encampment at a place called Tippecanoe. He attacks the encampment, and it's full of women and children and some warriors, but Tecumseh is not there, neither are most of his chiefs and warriors. And so it is a quote-unquote victory for America and William Henry Harrison at the Battle of Tippecanoe, but we haven't crushed this Pan-Indian alliance because Tecumseh wasn't caught and captured or killed. Throughout the course of the War of 1812, we're going to see fighting in the West continue. So as we talk about the United States fighting the British Army and Navy on the East Coast and the Atlantic, simultaneously we're going to see the United States fighting the British allies, the Native Americans in the Ohio River Valley and also in the Southwest. 
Let's go to 1812. So what we're going to do is we're going to cover this war year by year, 1812, 1813, 1814. 1812, the United States has to decide if they want to go to war with Great Britain. Of course, Congress has that power. And within Congress, the group of states, the group of politicians that want war are called war hawks. And they are led by a young politician from Kentucky named of Henry Clay. Now, we're going to talk a lot about Henry Clay in upcoming lectures. Henry Clay is a Westerner. If you look on this map, Kentucky, Kentucky is on the frontier at this time. And they are the ones suffering from these Native American attacks. And so they want to declare war on England. England, after all, is giving these Native Americans guns. And they're encouraging Native Americans to attack Kentucky. And so Henry Clay and his fellow Kentuckians desperately want this war to punish the British and stop them from giving weapons to the Indians. But there's another reason the people in the West want the war with the British. The British have Canada. And southern Canada is very rich soil. It's lush. It's green. And these farmers in Kentucky and Tennessee and Ohio, they desperately want Canada as more cropland. And so we see that they are arguing for war. Now, at this time, there are also people called doves who don't want the war, um, and they're gonna, we're going to find out who they are in just a second. But So if we were to go back in time to 1812, we see some of the ideas percolating for war um, among the Americans is there's this cry for free trade, free land, and national honor. So let's talk about one of those, each one of those three, three things separately. Free trade. We know that the English have been oppressing our sailors. They have been impressing our sailors and seizing our ships, and taking away our right to trade freely with whoever we want. And so that's why we talk about free trade. Trade. Next, we want land. And that's referencing the Western states' uh, desire for land in Canada. And then we have this idea of national honor. Americans are tired of England not respecting our rights in an independent nation, arming Indians in our territory, um, attacking our ships on the seas, abducting our sailors. And so they say, we need to go to war because we need to protect America's honor. And so here we see a list of states. This has actually been on an exam before, and it shows the states who voted for the war, who voted against the war. And what we notice is that this is grouped by region. And if we look down at the bottom, Ohio, Kentucky, and Tennessee, these are the three western states, and they vote overwhelmingly for war with Great Britain because they're the ones that are going to benefit the most from war with Great Britain. They're a long ways away from the Atlantic, so they're not going to get attacked by the British Army. Um, and they hope that if we go to war with England, we're going to get some of that Canadian land. We can take over Canada for these western farmers. Then we see up in the northeast, not all of the states, but most of the states like uh, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, Connecticut, New Jersey, Delaware, they're all voting against war with England for the simple reason, for the main reason that these states all depend on trade with England for their economy. It's their number one trading partner. And if we go to war with England, we're not going to be able to trade with England. And so we're going to see that the economy of the northeast is going to fall. Then we have the southern states, and the southern states, for the most part, vote for the war. Virginia, 14 to 5, Maryland, 6 to 3, 8 to nothing in South Carolina, Georgia, so forth and so on. And they are afraid that the English are going to incite rebellions among their slaves. They're also hopeful that we can get more land um, from Canada, perhaps, or move further west. Uh, and if we, if we defeat the English, we're going to have a better chance of doing that. Plus, maybe we can acquire Florida. So there's many reasons that the South is joining to support their Western brothers in, in supporting the war. So as you can see here that the United States in 1812 declares war against a much larger, much more powerful, as far as army goes, uh, Great, Great, Great Britain. And so the first year of the war does not go well for the United States. We are a very ill-prepared nation. Um, as you can remember on the last slide, not all of America wanted this war, so it's hard to go into a war when not everybody is together on your side. Um, uh, next, we see that Congress, Madison is going to want to pass a law to create conscription or the draft because our army is very small. Remember, Jefferson shrunk our army, and so he tries to get through Congress a law that will create a draft. Um, he feels we need this to win the war, but so a lot of the southern states and some of the northern states will say no to this, right? The federal government is now getting stronger. Uh, if we are able to draft people, it increases the size and power of the federal government and the army, and so this goes down to defeat. And so we see that even to defend our country, some of the states say no to the war and other states say we're not going to pass this conscription law, even though our army desperately needs these troops. 
is the draft a traditional Democratic Republican value? When James Madison says we need to have a draft or conscription law, that, like I said, is going to be something that increases the size and power of the federal government. And when it gets voted down, it shows you that the Democratic Republican Party, now that they're in power, are trying to do things to increase the size and power of the federal government. And the states that are objecting to this law are Federalists, Northeastern states, and they want to limit the size and scope of the federal government. So once again, we see this flip-flop of parties. When the Federalists were in power, they wanted a strong government. Now that they're out, they want to limit it. Conversely, when the Democratic Republicans were out of power, they wanted a weak government, and now that they're in power, they want to strengthen it. So it's interesting we have this flip-flop among political parties. In addition to that, it's going to be hard for us to win in 1812, because remember, Jefferson had reduced the army down to about 2,500 men. So we have no chance of defeating the British army with just 2,500 men and no draft. And then, to make things worse, the United States is going to invade Canada, which shows you perhaps the real reason for this war is to get land and not so much national honor, because the first thing we do, we invade Canada for land. Um, and we divide our small army into three parts, and we invade Canada from three different directions, and we lose, we lose, we lose. Simply because our, no our army is outnumbered, they're poorly led, and so the first year of the war does not go well for the United States. Let's talk about the second year of the war, 1813. Things definitely go better. Now, in 1812, we invaded Canada and lost, and so we're afraid that in 1813, the Canadians and the British will mount a, a counter-invasion of the United States. And the primary way to get from Canada to the United States is across the Great Lakes. And so James Madison puts Oliver Hazard Perry in charge of the Great Lakes. He's a Navy man, and it's his job to defend the U.S. border on the Great Lakes. And so he hastily, and him and his troops, hastily build a fleet of ships to protect our border on the Great Lakes. And they will fight a naval battle on the Great Lakes, and they will win. And he famously sends a message to Thomas Jefferson, we have met the enemy on the Great Lakes, and they are ours. And so we see 1813 is starting out a little bit better for the United States. And after that, William Henry Harrison is still looking for Tecumseh, and he finally finds him, and they engage in battle at the Battle of the Thames um, in the Ohio River Valley. And we see in this artist's rendering of the picture of the battle, William Henry Harrison shooting Tecumseh. Now, it didn't come down to one, our guy defeating their guy in hand-to-hand -hand combat, but so that's just trying the artist trying to make William Henry Harrison look more heroic, if you will. But we see that the, there's an importance to this battle, is that when William Henry Harrison is able to meet and defeat Tecumseh, he just doesn't defeat Tecumseh. He defeats most of the important chiefs of these Native American tribes that are allied with him. And for the most part, this is going to wipe out Native American resistance to white settlement in the Northwest Territory, in Ohio, Indiana, Michigan, those places. And so after the war, we're going to see rapid post-war white settlement of this region because of this battle. Now we go to 1814, the last official year of the war, and again, it's bad. So we have good year, bad year, good year, I'm sorry, bad year, good year, bad year for the Americans. So 1814 is another bad year, and the reason is because Napoleon is defeated in Europe, and that had previously taken most of England's navy and army. They were fighting the war in Europe, and so they really didn't send that much to defeat America. But now that Napoleon is defeated, the British are going to send a large army to America since it's been freed up, and the Navy. And so now they're going to focus all their attentions on the United States. The British, of course, are going to land their main army in the Chesapeake. This is where our national capital is, and the British will conquer the capital, take it, and burn it to the ground. And this is humiliating for the United States. We have just lost our national capital. What we see in the picture is the White House burning at this time. Now, the British have already taken our capital, and there's another major city in the area, and that city is Baltimore. So to get from Washington, D.C. to Baltimore, the British Army has to pass this American fort called Fort McHenry. And as they're on their way to Baltimore, they, they attack Fort McHenry. They have to do this if they want to take Baltimore. And this is a very important battle in the war because if the British are able to take more Fort McHenry, they're probably going to be able to destroy Baltimore, another American city, adding to our demoralization, perhaps making us want to sue for peace. And so as the British are marching on Baltimore, they capture many Americans in the area that they think are spies. And one of these guys is the name of Francis Scott Key. We see him in the picture standing on the railing of the ship. So the British abduct him, and they hold him prisoner on the ship during the course of the battle. And they say, look, when the battle's over, we'll let you go. 
Um, and so he is being held prisoner on the ship, and he witnesses the Battle of Fort McHenry. The battle starts at around nighttime, and throughout the night, he keeps looking over the ramparts of the boat, the, the railing of the boat, and he sees the American flag continue to fly above the fort. And as long as that flag is flying, he knows that the Americans are still in control of the fort. And through rockets, red glare, bombs bursting in air, um, he sees our flag is still there. Um, by the dawn, he notices that, the, that he's still on board the ship, and the British have not taken the fort because our flag is still waving. And he rejoices, and so he writes a poem down about his experience watching the battle over the night. And as you can tell, probably, that this eventually, after the war, there'll be music set to the poem. It'll become our national anthem. And so America wins at Fort McHenry, and so Baltimore is safe. So we've had one horrible defeat. We've lost our capital, but we have saved Baltimore. In the Southwest, we're going to see more battles on the frontier. Um, we're going to send this young, um, younger Army general, and his name is Andrew Jackson, and we send him to go deal with the Native American or Indian threat in the Southwest. So he meets up with uh, someone of a pan-Indian alliance, just like we saw in the Northwest, and he defeats them at the Battle of Horseshoe Bend in Alabama. Um, and this is going to, just like the Battle of the Thames, it is going to, after the war, get rid of the Indian threat and make it easy for large amounts of uh, white Americans to move on to previous Indian lands and settle quickly Alabama and Mississippi after the war. So now we're still in 1814 and in the Northeast the Federalist Party or what's left of the Federalist Party is very angry. Their economy has been destroyed going all the way back to Thomas Jefferson's embargo. And then even though when John Jefferson lifted the embargo and replaced it with the Non-Intercourse Act, our economy was still bad because we couldn't trade with our main two trading partners, England and France. And then when Macon's Bill number two was passed, even though we could trade with France, we still aren't trading with our number one par trading partner, England. And so throughout, over the years, the Federalists and New England have been suffering because a lot of the people in New England are merchants. And then when the War of 1812 starts, as you can see in this map, the English Navy puts up a blockade so we can't trade with anybody. And so for years, the Federalists have been angry at the Democratic Republicans in Washington, D.C. for destroying their economy. And so a group of Federalists decide to get together in Hartford and figure out what to do about this. How can we make life more livable and tolerable for all of these Federalists? And the main thing they talk about is what are the ways that we can limit the federal government's power, i.e. the Democratic Republicans' power, so they can't continue to make our life miserable. And here again we see this interesting change. When the Federalists were in power in Washington, D.C., they were loose constructionists, they believe in strong government, but now that they're out of power, they don't like the things the government is doing, and so they're trying to emphasize strict construction and weaken the national government. At the Hartford Convention, they discuss many things that they'd like the federal government to do, and all of them are trying to limit the power of the federal government. The most notable one being to propose that in order for Congress to pass an embargo in the future, they're going to need a two-thirds vote instead of a simple majority. And this would basically tie the hands of Congress, make it weaker, make it harder to pass embargoes in the future. And so here we see as an example of the Federalist Party trying to limit the power of the federal government. Now these Federalists, they come up with their lists, and they send representatives from Connecticut down to Washington, D.C. in late 1814, early 1815. And they go to Congress and they list their demands. They say, we want a weaker federal government, we believe in strict construction, and we also want to change the Constitution so it requires a two-thirds vote uh, before we can have an embargo. There's even gossip that the Federalists are going to go so far as to propose secession. That if we don't get our way, if, if the federal government is not looking out for the Northeast, if they don't do what the Federalist Party wants, we're perhaps going to secede, form our own country, leave the United States, maybe even go back and join, rejoin Britain. Now, as they're making these demands and talking of secession, word that the war is over reaches Washington, D.C. And this is just bad timing for the Federalists. At the moment that they're saying all of these things, that they're questioning America, and they're saying the United States government is too strong, the America learns that we have, quote-unquote, won the war, the war is over. And so many Americans feel that the Federalist Party are unpatriotic, that they're naysayers, that they, you know, they were threatened to leave in the moment of our victory. And so this is kind of the death knell 
for the Federalist Party. It puts the nail in their coffin. It's the last straw, however you want to say it. Most Americans start to look at the Federalist Party as something of the past. They're unpatriotic, and we need to do away with them. And so this is kind of the last gasp of the Federalist Party. We're going to see that they're not really anything that we need to think about or worry about in the future. They are considered just too unpatriotic and too sectional, too small, and the Federalist Party is quickly disintegrating and will go away. Here we see a very popular political cartoon of the time, and in fact it's been on previous exams. It shows you the Hartford Convention in the caption, and it says, Leap or no leap? At the top of the cliff, we see Federalists, prominent Federalists, and they're trying to decide whether we should leave America and leap into the waiting arms of England, rejoin England or not. And so when we, whenever you see this political cartoon, you know that it's talking about the Hartford Convention and them considering perhaps betraying America at this time and going back and joining Great Britain. So the treaty that ends the war is called the Treaty of Ghent. Ghent is in Belgium, and that's why it's named the treaty, because that's where the treaty is done. And the United States ambassador um, that is representing us at the treaty is a guy by the name of John Quincy Adams, son of the former president, John Adams. And the treaty basically ends the fighting of the war, and it says that we are not going to fight anymore. And why does Britain do this? I mean, after all, they just destroyed our capital. They almost took over Baltimore. Britain seems like they have the upper hand in the war at this point. They do it because England, after fighting all of these wars, including the Revolution, the French and Indian War before that, and now this war with Napoleon, England's broke, and they don't want to continue the war. Who, know long, who knows how long this war with America will last? And, and so they just say, we're out of money, and it's in our best interest to just end it. And it's that the people of England are weary of fighting wars. For all of these wars, they just keep going on and on and on. And so the people of England put pressure on their government to end the war. So the Treaty of Ghent, it really doesn't solve anything. America doesn't get Canada. Canada doesn't get the United States. We return to our previous boundaries we had before the war. So in a sense, you could say that the, that the war really solved nothing. However, that would be disingenuous. That's not exactly true. There is some things that are going to be changed because of the war. So we'll talk about that in a minute. Now let's talk about the last battle of the war, which oddly enough is after the war is over. The Battle of New Orleans happens in January 6th of 1815. The Treaty of Ghent was signed around Christmas time. And so the reason the battle happens is because Americans don't know that the war is over yet. So when the battle occurs, yes, the treaty has been signed ending the war, but news of that, since we don't have radio and television or cell phones, hasn't reached America yet. So let's set up the battle. You can see the blockade around the United States of the British Navy, and the most important port we have, perhaps, is New Orleans in the bottom of the map. Now, of course, New Orleans controls access to the Mississippi, which controls access to the Ohio River Valley, which is how most American farmers get their crops to market. And so the British want to take this fort. If they can take New Orleans away from America, they will cripple the Western economy, bring America to her knees. And of course, the United States cannot let this happen. And so fresh from his victory at the Battle of Horseshoe Bend, Andrew Jackson goes to New Orleans to defend the city against the British invasion. The British outnumber the Americans in this battle, but the Americans win because we're dug in and we're behind some embankments and battlements and so when the British come we're protected we're covered and they're not and so it's a huge victory for the United States we see in this artist's rendering of the, of the battle there's Andrew Jackson on top of the barricade um, you know inspiring his men this did not happen because it would be stupid for a general to do that but the point of view of the artist he's trying to glorify the United States and he's trying to glorify General Jackson so America hears about the Battle of New Orleans in early 1815 at the same time that they hear about the Treaty of Ghent. And so in Americans' minds, they hear that Jackson wins this battle, and then they quickly hear that the war is over. And so Andrew Jackson emerges as the hero of the war. Americans mistakenly believe that he is the reason why we quote-unquote won the war. When even though he'd fought the battle after the war was over just because of timing. So we will see that Jackson will become a national hero, and at, at some point soon he'll become president of the United States because of this popularity. 
The next thing we're going to talk about in the next section, the last section, section C, we're going to talk about all of the impacts of the war. And for the most part, this is the most important thing you need to pay attention to. Yes, the causes of the war. Yes, what goes on in the war is important. But wars are important because they accelerate change. They, they change America permanently after. And one of the things we're going to see, Americans have an intense sense of nationalism. We have pride in these victories over the British. And so section C, the war's impact on America. Number one, nationalism develops. As you can see in this picture, nationalism is the idea that we are Americans and we are so proud of it. It's patriotism. Before this time, if you were to go to America before the War of 1812 and say to somebody in Virginia, are you an American? They probably would have said, I'm a Virginian. Or if you go to New York, I'm a New Yorker. Um, and so we don't see that Americans are unified in any way and proud of their country as much as they could have been. But when we defeat the British, quote unquote, defeat the British a second time, we have this tremendous outpouring of pride in our country and it unites us. And so we see this sailor in this picture pray, uh, proudly waving the American flag and Lady Liberty is putting the laurels of victory on his head. And so one of the results of the War of 1812 is it gives us a sense of increased nationalism. We have heroes of the war, William Henry Harrison, Andrew Jackson. We also have patriotic songs, the national anthem. And so Americans have this outpouring of national pride. Because of this, we see an impact in American culture. If we look at American literature of the time, before the War of 1812, American authors, they really didn't exist. If we have authors, they are talking about political ideas, Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, Ben Franklin, but we don't have a lot of authors that focus on literature or fiction. And if we do have any authors, they really tend to copy British styles. They will have their books set in England, and they will have British-sounding characters, and they'll have themes that are something common that you might read in a book in England. But after the War of 1812, Americans are so proud of their success that we're going to see this rub off on American authors. All of a sudden, American authors start to celebrate American themes, like life on the frontier, or they set their stories in America. And so we see James Fenimore Cooper, he's a famous author of this time, and he wrote a whole series of books called The Leather Stocking Tales, and one of the most popular of these books is a, is a book called The Last of the Mohicans, and it's celebrating American um, identity. Um, he sets this book during the French and Indian War, more or less, and it's about uh, a life on the American frontier and what can be more American than that. And so Native Americans are prominent in his book, and he celebrates the her heroism of frontiersmen. And so we certainly see that this is moving away from focusing on British themes and now focusing on American themes. Another author who fits this time period is Washington Irving. He writes many books. One of them is a biography of George Washington, again, focusing on Americans, but he also will go around New York collecting local myths and stories from the people of New York. And one of these is uh, The Legend of Sleepy Hollow, New York and Massachusetts, so forth. And then The Legend of Sleepy Hollow, it's a legend about the Headless Horseman, and this is an American myth. So he's not writing down mythology of England or Germany or France, but he's focusing on American folklore. I mean, he's celebrating it. He's, he's bringing it to the forefront, and so Americans... Uh, we see this in increased nationalism in our literature. You know, we love America, so let's read about American ideas and topics and folklore. Next, another consequence of the war, as we've mentioned previously, is the West is open for settlement. Though, of course, Americans have been moving West ever since our beginnings, but one of the things that kept us going from in bigger numbers to the Ohio River Valley was there were lots of Native Americans who were fighting us, stopping us from going there. But because of the Battle of Horseshoe Bend, the Battle of the Thames, um, the Battle of Tippecanoe, we see that now the, we have cleared out, quote-unquote, the Native threat. Most of the Native American tribes have been soundly defeated, and so Americans after the war can start moving west in large numbers. And indeed, if you look on this map, it shows you the states that are in this kind of I don't know, rust color, this darker brown color. We see that in 1818, Illinois becomes a state. 1816, Indiana. 1821, Missouri. 1817, Mississippi. 1819, Alabama. And so we see this, this rapid settlement of the West of all of these territories now have enough white people to become states. And this is because of the War of 1812, clearing out the Indian resistance. Next, manufacturing increases in America because of the war. Now, this is not an intended thing. When uh, Thomas Jefferson 
does his embargo, and then James Madison has his war, we're not able to trade with the British, but Americans still need plows and dresses and shoes. And so Americans in the Northeast start to fulfill that need. They start manufacturing their own goods. Um, and so American manufacturing is going to start because of the embargo and then the war. This is going to lead America into what we call um, the market revolution, America's first industrial revolution. So the war launches us down the road to manufacturing. The reason I have oops here is because Jefferson and Madison were Democratic Republicans. They wanted a country of farmers, not of cities and manufacturing. But because of their foreign policy, because of the embargo, and because of the Non-Intercourse Act, and Macon's Bill Number 2, and then because of the war, we couldn't trade with England, and so we had to start making our own things. So unintentionally, they launch America down the road to manufacturing. Here we see one of our first factories in America. We'll talk more about Lowell, Massachusetts, but notice it's located next to a water, so it's a water mill, it's a textile mill. Next we see this thing emerge from the War of 1812 called the American System. One of the big proponents of the American System was a gentleman by the name of Henry Clay that we've talked about before. And the idea uh, coming out of this war is that we've now fought the British twice in a relatively short amount of time, and we don't want another war to occur. And we feel that America must be strong. America, if we're ever invaded again, have to be able to stand up for ourselves. We have to be a strong, economically independent country, so we never have to have the humiliation of having our capital burned. And so the only way to do that is to increase our manufacturing, to make America economically strong. Another reason we do this after the war is it helps us be isolationist. We figure that the reason we got drawn into this war is because we were too dependent on trade with England and France. And so if we can develop our own manufacturing in America, farmers can grow crops in America, they can sell them to cities in America, cities can make goods and then sell them to farmers, America will be kind of self-sufficient. We will never have to depend on other countries, and so we don't have to send our ships to some other place. They won't, they won't be, uh, uh, you know, our sailors won't be impressed, our ships won't be seized because we just won't be trading with the rest of the world. We will just be trading with ourselves, and this will help us to stay isolationist. So how do we build up American industry? If that's the American system, let's make America independent and economically strong. How do we become powerful? And so if we think about this, this is really just a reincarnation of Alexander Hamilton's plan. Here's another synthesis. Under Washington's presidency, when Hamilton was the Secretary of the Treasury, he said America would be strong and economically independent. And we see we're just kind of recycling that idea. It's just come back because of the War of 1812 and some of the weaknesses that that war highlighted. And so um, we talked about the champion of this, this new American system being Henry Clay. And he says, Henry Clay says that what we need to make America strong, just like Hamilton, is we need a national bank. Now, of course, Hamilton's bank um, expired in 1816. It was only supposed to last for 20 years, and then it went away. And so he says, after the War of 1812, we need to bring this bank back because businesses need to have a place they can go to borrow money to start up or to make their businesses bigger. And so what we're going to see is we're going to have something called the Second Bank of the United States or the National Bank um, come back into America. And we'll be arguing about this in the future, but this is the reason that we want a national bank again to make America economically strong. Next, Henry Clay argues for internal improvements. Internal improvements is roads and canals and bridges, those kinds of things. And so we see in the top right-hand picture, this is the construction of the Erie Canal. It will connect New York to the Great Lakes. And think of how that will make America strong. All of those farmers in the West, they will be able to grow their crops, and they won't have to send them down the Ohio River anymore. They can put their crops on a barge in the Great Lakes, send it through this canal. The canal is just a waterway, a man-made waterway, and it'll connect to New York and then go out to the rest of the world. And so this will make America be able to connect its raw materials, its crops, to its markets, its cities, and that's why it's called the market revolution. In addition to that, there's a strong desire to build a national road. So it's going to go, it's going to connect the East Coast all the way across the Appalachian Mountains in the Ohio River Valley and go as far eventually as Illinois, connecting farmers to cities, raw materials to markets, right? Finished goods to their markets out west. And so this is why it's called the market revolution, connecting the east and west together in one tight-knit economy. 
Then he also wants to bring back the protective tariff. If you remember, this was Hamilton's plan. We need to have high taxes on imports tariffs and that will force Americans to buy American-made goods. The reason we want to do this in 1816 is because the War of 1812 was over. Once again, just like after the War to the American Revolution, synthesis, we see that England is going to start dumping um, all of their cheap goods on American shores, putting all of those baby American industries out of business. And to keep that from happening, we want to shield our shores from English imports by putting up a tariff. Right? By putting a tax on British imports, you make the British imports more expensive, forcing Americans to buy American-made goods, helping our baby industry grow. So all of these things are supposed to work together to make America a more economically independent country, and we know this is the American system. James Madison, the president, after the War of 1812, he opposes this. He will try to veto many of these proposals because James Madison is a Democratic Republican. Now, during the war, he did a lot of things that we talked about, like the draft and so forth, um, uh, you know, Macon's Bill Number 2, to strengthen the size and power of the federal government to do the things he wanted to do. But now that the war is over, he starts to go back to being a strict constructionist um, and trying to weaken the federal government. The crisis is over. He reasons that we don't need a strong government anymore. In addition to that, many of the things that we've listed in the American system, the National Bank, internal improvements, and protective tariffs are not going to help the South. And that's where James Madison's from. He's from Virginia. The tariff will hurt the South as consumers and producers. Internal improvements aren't going to be built in the South. They're going to be built up in the North. And the National Bank, of course, is going to help Northern businesses, and it's going to be controlled by Northern businessmen. And for all of these reasons, James Madison says that this is not something we should do. He's back on strict construction. So this shows you, as I've just mentioned, that America has this thing called sectionalism growing, that the South is starting to look out just for the South, the North is looking out just for the North, and the West starts to look out just for the West. And so we have this weird thing going on in 1816 at this time. America is intensely nationalistic, we're proud of our country, but already we see that this intense nationalism, it's not going to last very long. As we wrestle with issues in the future, we're going to start to pass legislation that helps one part of America, but not another, tearing apart that brief period of nationalism. Next, what's our last consequence of the War of 1812? America is going to gain some international respect. The British don't fear us, but they have taken us on twice, and if not lost, at least not won twice in the American Revolution the War of 1812. And so Great Britain is hesitant, and France and Spain, to mess with the United States. And of course, this is a dramatic change. When America was under the Articles of Confederation, England, France, Spain, they all messed with us. They either closed off New Orleans, they harassed our ships, they wouldn't let us trade with their colonies. But now they're less he they're hesitant to do that. They're hesitant to try to bully America because we took on the British twice and we, if not defeated them, at least held our own twice. And so now the United States is kind of entering the world stage as a respectable country. Nobody's fearing us. We're not a superpower. But they're also less likely to mess with us. The United States is growing in size. The Louisiana Purchase. We're growing in population. The economy is growing with the American system. All of these things are making America a much stronger country. So here we have this quote, Michael Scott is a British lieutenant in the army. And I think we see this, this idea of respect growing from this quote. He says, I do not like Americans. I never did and I never shall like them. I have no wish to eat with them, drink with them, deal with them or consort with them in any way. So obviously he doesn't like America. He's fought us twice. But let me tell the whole truth, nor fight with them, Americans. Were it not for the laurels to be acquired by overcoming an enemy so brave, determined, and alert, and in every way so worthy of one still, as the Americans have always proved. And so he doesn't like us, but, event but he has, we have gained his respect. And so that's what I'm trying to talk about here with this slide. It's the last consequence of the war. Now what we have here for the last slide of these notes is emerging from the war, America is going to go into a new era. It's called the era of good feelings. And this is something that Americans feel after the War of 1812. The reason they feel this is because, let's start in the top left and go clockwise. 
Americans feel a sense of national pride, so they feel very good about their country, right? We just defeated the British, lots of nationalism, lots of pride. Next, because of the American system, we have a growing economy. And so Americans feel very optimistic about the future. America, they think the sky's the limit for the America. We can become a strong, powerful country. Next, bottom right, one party rule. I told you that the Federalist Party, because of the Hartford Convention and their bad timing, they're going to be severely weak and then eventually go away. So when we go into the era after the War of 1812, into what is the presidency of James Monroe, he's after Madison, we see that there's only one political party in America, and surely this is a good thing. We can get along. We won't have any of this party anger that we've had in the past between Democratic, Republicans, and Federalists. We're all one party. We're all Americans. And... Who knows what we could do if we all work together? And then, of course, in the bottom left, we see a growing population. America's growing in size, it's growing in power, it's growing in population, and we're feeling very optimistic at the start of the era of good feelings, and that rounds out some of the results of the War of 1812.